in this discussion about um, antibodies, antibody immunity, whether antibody immunity is the, um, the best kind of immunity that one might uh, want to induce with a, a vaccine campaign. Um, there is also this interesting paper that showed up in Nature. I only briefly saw it before we went on today, but it's clearly relevant. Um, Zach, do you want to put on that, uh, that paper? Uh, yeah. Um, so this is a report. This is Nature. Um, and it talks about something which people who've been watching Dark Horse for some time will remember you and I talked about earlier, much earlier in the pandemic, the possibility that there might be hybrid herd immunity that comes from some people uh, having received their immunity through an inoculation, some people having uh, that immunity through uh, exposure to the pathogen, and that really were the inoculations good at producing a uh, uh, an immunity to contracting the disease, that you could get there by a combination of those two processes. Well, I haven't seen this paper yet, yep. um, but it looks from just what I can see of the abstract here that they at least looked at not just antibody response, but also T-cell response. Yep, they did. Now scroll down, Zach, if you would towards the end of the abstract. Um, it says... It says full vaccination was crucial to provide hybrid immunity. Among right, other things. what you have to say if you're going to publish in Nature. Um, uh, however, when designing vaccine strategies, T-cell exhaustion after multiple vaccinations should be considered. This is literally the first time I've seen this paper. Yep. Have you seen it enough to know on yep. what basis they are saying... You know that that what? looks encrypted. That looks encoded to be like okay. We had to say these things, and we're going to be a little bit cryptic here. But what did they see? What did they that made them conclude that your T cell exhaustion after multiple vaccinations should be considered? Which, like, given the way abstracts are written now on this topic, that sounds like this is what we found. But we only are able to say maybe this. Right. right. What they saw was a substantial drop in. T cell reactivity after multiple boosts mm. by the vaccines, and the reason that so I raise IgG four and T cell are dropping. Uh, IgG four is increasing, which is an oh, attenuation yeah, signal. So yeah, the the <laughs> right right. <laughs> I got a sign problem. I got to keep track of the signs. But yep. IgG four is increasing, which is causing a drop in uh, responsiveness. Right, and, and separately, oh, boy. T cell responsiveness is dropping in multiply inoculated people. Now, the implications of that are likely to be complex, hard to parse. But one thing at the level of the discussion that we've just had, what this looks like is that these particular inoculations, whether the people who designed and or produced them knew what they were doing or not, seems to be dragging the uh, battle against SARS-CoV-2 in those who have subjected themselves, at least to the mRNA uh, vaccination campaign, dragging the fight into the realm of B cells and antibodies and away from T cells, mm -hmm. right? Now, people who have studied viruses are liable to be alarmed at that because viral immunity over on the T cell side is likely to be superior. And so, this is yet another variation on a theme. Didn't see that exact result coming, but we have talked about things like uh, original antigenic sin. Original antigenic sin means that once you've given the immune system a potent message about a particular pathogen, the immune system loses its objectivity, it loses its creativity, and it becomes tracked into making that first response that it made. And that is not a good thing, right? You want the immune system to be dynamic, to be capable of switching gears if it needs to, and tracking it into this uh, one response is not a good idea. So that's original antigenic sin. There is antibody-dependent enhancement, in which a pathogen uh, utilizes the antibodies that it can predict are going to land on its surface as a mechanism for gaining access to cells that it would not be 
uh, otherwise able to do. And, you know, now we've got attenuation signals, right? Attenuation signals uh, are not in either of those categories exactly, but does seem like uh, a consequence of something analogous to original antigenic sin. Um, and now we see T cells uh, standing down. That's like, you know, is that a consequence of an attenuation signal? What is it? Right. But in any case, it's, uh, it, it is so many different demonstrations of what you and I said very simply without um, any specificity at all, right? Welcome to complex systems. You are intervening in a interaction between a pathogen and the immune system. That's one complex system inside of a person. That's another complex system inside of a society in, in, in a pandemic. Okay, that's... but by but, but that description, and we have said that multiple yep. times, by that description, so too is any vaccine. Yep. Right. So any any vaccine is going to actually have those three layers of, of complexity yep. um, that that is true about it. And you know what isn't included in the rendering that you just gave is the novelty up upon novelty upon novelty. I think there's at least three um, in the mRNA vaccines. Yep. Like you know, there there are at least well, yes. So it's the mRNA um, being used to effectively turn you into a factory for the antigen. Yep. It's the introduction of the pseudouridine into the mRNA so it doesn't decay. Yep. And it's the lipid nanoparticles. Uh, that are coding the mRNA so that they aren't found by the uh, RNAs, yep. right, um, in the intercellular space to to also not let them decay. So all all three of those things, and I'm I'm sure there are many more than that, but those are the three that come to mind. Like, oh, this is this is so novel with no track record. Right. Um, so I will just put an asterisk on that last one. The lipid nanoparticles are in and of themselves uh, novel, and who knows what their consequence is, but the, the lack of a targeting mechanism so that whatever they're doing is just happening all over the body is a critical design failure. Right. Um, but I agree with you. It, the nested complex systems are always there. It's the intervening with something novel and thinking that you know what's going to happen. Oh, no, you don't. Mm -hmm. Right. The best thing you can do is you can work in a f way that is close, is closely enough, is similar enough to something you've done and seen the response and hopefully tracked the consequences over the course of decades following that gives you some confidence that this works. But even that we've seen, we've seen traditional vaccines fail. Right. You've seen them introduced and we've seen safety signals cause them to be removed from the market. And so the point is, that's not foolproof, but at least it's something. Yeah. Right. And here what they did was an absolutely at least triply novel intervention in a nested series of complex systems where, you know, it was just obvious that they weren't going to be able to predict the outcome. And, you know, it is much worse than it might have been uh, so far it's not as bad as it might have been you know it's arbitrary in terms of its level of terribleness but it, it you know it, it was very unlikely that with that level of novelty in that level of complexity that their hopes were going to be mirrored by the consequence and we, we've seen them uh, embarrassed or at least they should be embarrassed at uh, at what actually happened no, I don't. I don't see any evidence of embarrassment. Honestly, um, <clears throat> we are seeing more and more suggestions uh, that it is not as uh, those who are actually trying to help humanity would have hoped. Uh, yeah. But the evidence of embarrassment on behalf of uh, those who pushed these things, I don't see. I don't see it. <clears throat> 